Hello and welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast ran by a Makerspace director and two other volunteers at this point. <laughs> we are here to talk about making stuff in maker culture. I am your host, Christian, and joining me tonight are... Aaron. And Joe. And we are here to talk about all the things that are happening on the internet and abroad when it comes to making really cool stuff. Uh, we got a bunch of cool stuff lined up for tonight, and we're going to be talking about some maker news, um, some stuff on our personal projects, finally an update for the long-awaited first episode. We're going to touch on some of the stuff that we've been working on and how much progress we've made. Um, but first, as always, what are you guys drinking tonight? I am actually drinking, wait for it, vodka, Coke Zero. <laughs> Would it happen to be Kirkland vodka? Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, Kirkland's Man. going to call us and be like, hey, guys, you want some money? So, so <laughs> right? we were supposed to get a ton of snow and ice this weekend. Yeah. Yep. Where was that at? Yeah, so we went we went grocery shopping Friday after work, and we got like all ready to just be... I actually haven't left the house all weekend. It's so, like that we, we succeeded in that. But I'm like, man, Fair I could enough. get some beer, but that's not only gonna last me like a day. So I got, <laughs> I got a whole thing of vodka. Oh man, you know most people they get water, toilet paper, paper towels, all the essentials. You go straight for the hard liquor because, man, if I'm gonna get snowed in, I might as well be f- just drunk off my butt. <laughs> Must be snowed in. <laughs> it's a non-perishable. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. It, it is non-perishable. I will I, give you that credit. And in the right container, who can tell the difference between water and vodka? Right. <laughs> yeah, like, I like I like to replace all my empty water bottles with vodka and then throw them back in the pile. <laughs> you got about a 50-50 chance. What are you rolling? <laughs> now, as the uh, weekend gets through, your chances go up or down, depending on your opinion. <laughs> That's right. Fair enough. Fair uh, enough. All right. And I'm drinking uh, our RCL beer that we made uh, on my birthday back in November. Uh, Chris and I and a few other members from the Makerspace got together and we brewed up. Uh, we called it the RCL CNC. So it's um, yep. cinnamon, naraha, or oranges, and yep. uh, chili, chili peppers. Uh, into a porter and it's actually really good <laughs> yeah when it like this was kind of a cool thing um where we got to make our own beer with our neighbors which was even cooler industry um, brewing and industry brewing um and uh it was kind of cool because like even when it first came off um me and ryan were two of the last ones there uh finishing it off and we took the first sample, and it was super sweet. You could really taste the um, this kind of chocolatey um, orange peel, and it was it was really good. And then as it was allowed to just rest and kind of go on, it just got even better. Like it's it's a really good beer, um, and uh, unfortunately they are already out at our or, uh, at industry. So yeah, we have the last two um known so <laughs> but yeah it was a really good um really good kind of experience to be able to share that with our our neighbors and get to make something cool with them um so with that we're going to jump into our news we've only got a couple things um uh, but finally uh darkly labs has released the orders for the emblazer core yay um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um this is really cool because we kind of got to talk with um dominic what dominic from uh darkly a little bit ago joe had an interview with him um kind of t- touching a little bit on this as well aaron was in that um one. oh wait, wait that's right yeah, i was the jerk. only one who wasn't in that one yeah shoot because i listened to it and i was like this is really cool and i want to talk to him more but I totally forgot. Yeah. No, it, it was kind of cool, though, because um, he touched on this a little bit, and now it's finally out. Um, I can actually say that I'm already looking at getting one myself. 
um, especially for the price point, they've really done well at building this thing out um, and getting it into the people's hands. So, Chris, um, what is the Emblazer Core for those who aren't aware? So the Emblazer Core is designed for the hobbyist who is looking for an affordable laser cutter and engraver that is simply <laughs> to assemble and maintain. It utilizes the same technology as the Emblazer 2. The electronics and optics in the laser system are provide an amazing performance and a solid state based laser machine. Wow, is that just off the top of your head? Yeah, no, I just wow. I had like been doing all this research on it. It is an excellent laser. <sighs> yeah. I, I'm talking to Dominic right now, and and apparently my core is gonna ship tomorrow. Oh, oh man! Yeah. <sighs> so it's literally the M Blazer two, but without all the safety features and the pretty enclosure, and it's just a metal open frame M Blazer. Yes, yeah, it's actually laser cut acrylic open frame. The uh, the X Y stage is metal, but the the white that you see in the pictures is laser cut acrylic. Oh, it's acrylic. Yeah, interesting. Which they were kind of going into um, some of the other stuff at CanCut, um, which was like the uh, polypropylene, the plywood and the leather and corkboard. Um, and it's got some really good cut ratios on there. Um, I'm kind of looking at some of the Aerosys stuff right now, but like it looks like it's going to be another really good laser and the price point is pretty awesome on it. Um, yeah, I absolutely love my Emblazer too. I, yeah, I use it all the time, even though I've got my my big laser. So um, I know we had a discussion, uh, I think, when we had Dominic on of a CO2 versus diode. Yeah. And yeah. I'm a firm believer in diode lasers for hob like home hobbyist use. Definitely. Just because CO2 is such a hassle to maintain. Um, yep. I loved everything about the M Blazer 2, except for the price point. Yeah. So I'm really glad he came out with this kit because I'm really tempted to get one. And I, I mean, I, I want to get one. It's just a matter of convincing the wife to drop right. the money on it. Well, and, and someone like you, you don't need the class one laser features and you don't oh, need no. the fancy enclosure. So I live life on the edge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Why do you think I'm wearing glasses now? It's because I looked at the laser too much at the space. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, um, yeah, I I had the opportunity to review um, the assembly manual uh, for the Emblazer core and uh, talk to Dominic a little bit about the assembly process uh, because he, um, I, I'm also building another thing that I'm going to talk about later, and it turned into a bit of a monster. Um, and uh, I was curious if the core was going to be the same deal, and and he said that um, he expects someone like me to be able to put it together in about two to three hours. Um, and somebody wow. who's not very experienced with things like this five to six and, um, okay. going through the manual, I five to six seems pretty reasonable. If you're taking your time reading every step and being very, very careful about it. Um, I, I don't see any reason why most people couldn't build this thing. So I'm very excited for it. Okay. Yeah. And with um pretty much with all the accessories, it's priced around thirteen fifty. Um so one thousand three hundred and fifty dollars USD, um, which is an insanely good price for a diode laser. Um and that's with all the accessories. So actually price point starting is about nine hundred. So um we highly suggest going over and taking a look um at darklylabs.com. Um Dominic has been a really good friend to us, and we loved having him on. Um, so if you are interested, totally go out and check this out, because it is very much worth it. Um, going from that, we have another one about the carbon frame building. Uh, Aaron, you want to take that one on? Yeah, so there is a, a, a user that we, I saw on Reddit um, by the name of Brian Kevin. Um, he was, he's been building custom bicycle frames, and when you get really into the performance aspect of bicycle frames, you get into carbon fiber tubing. Mm -hmm. So you get the really lightweight and high strength applications. 
Mm. Um, but when he was looking at pricing out a frame, the the diameter of tubing he was he was trying to achieve, which was looking to be around like three inches or two to three inches diameter, it was being priced out at about anywhere between forty to seventy dollars a foot. Um, and, and it really depends on the quality of the carbon fiber and also the pattern of the winding. Um, you can get a really, the cheap ones have a very boring pattern, but the expensive ones have a very fun and interesting carbon fiber uh, pattern to it. But he figured that it, he was, he didn't want to pay that much for it, as we all don't want to do. Right. And my screen is freaking out. Anyways, um, so he's like, you know, as we all do, he's like, well, I can make it better and cheaper. <laughs> so what did he do? He went out and he made his own CNC carbon fiber tube winding machine. As all projects end up becoming. Yeah. Um, Everything revolves around CNC. <laughs> oh, yes. Everything becomes better with CNC. Of course it does. Um, everything's, everything's just a little bit better when our computer overlords are controlling it. <laughs> oh, yes. So it's a it's 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 like the perfect maker project because all the hardware is basic, you know, uh, just your twenty twenty aluminum um, uh, extrusion, some three D printed fittings. There's only two stepper motors to it. And yeah, because essentially he's got the the yeah. tube turning, and then it's driving the the little yeah. So real exactly. So there's only one stepper motor that turns the mandrel, which is the the uh, essentially the rod that spins that you wind on, and then one stepper motor to then pull a carriage back and forth. The winding of the mandrel drives the what they call the toe or the 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 carbon fiber thread. So you only need two, and that that's awesome. And and. Apparently the the build was very simple. The only complicated part was the software to get the algorithm to get it to move in a way to make an interesting pattern. But once you get that done, he was able to replicate the seventy dollar per foot carbon fiber tube at a price point of three dollars a foot. Which was insane. I'm curious if he was able to uh, get the same like resin penetration because that's a really big deal when you're doing carbon fiber. A lot of times they have to do that in a vacuum chamber. Um, Interesting. But that's like, one thing they mentioned in here was um, there was no mention of any sort of strength testing. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> the first one he did before he made this machine was he actually manually wrapped it and he said that was a huge pain in the butt just because trying to, you know resin coat this carbon fiber thread without getting his hands all coated in resin and yeah yeah but they're yeah the, the the pictures are awesome and uh he has a whole blog post on it where he explains how he did it this but um it's this project perfect hits, maker hits yeah. home with me because my life for the last two years professionally has been building precision winders so <laughs> Like watching the way he built this, I'm like, yeah, I know exactly how you did that, and I know exactly <laughs> why that was hard. <laughs> so this is—I mean, he's super cool project. Yeah, this is this is super. Like, I'm I'm getting mesmerized just watching the videos mm -hmm. and the fact that he's running it all through just like an Uno and a couple stepper motors, like, is freaking insane to me. Yeah. Like it, it looks like it. I would love to see a follow up to once he actually gets the entire build done and see how it's actually holding up. Because like, man, that could be really cool. Because I'm actually looking at building a a bike, possibly or buying a bike. I don't know which one yet, but like, if this is something that's actually viable, that would be really cool. <laughs> well, Chris. We can go through our, our normal discussion of do you want a project or do you want a bike? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess that that is a wow. That is a really good segue <laughs> into how are you guys' projects going? Uh, <laughs> we talked about a lot of them 
in our first episode um, and just kind of the stuff that we were looking forward to. And both of you guys, from what I've heard, have made pretty good strides uh, on both your projects. So um, who wants to go first? How are you guys doing? Go ahead, Joe. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that, that whole Midwest politeness. You should go. Right. No, you should go. You should go. No, you should go. Okay. Um, we need to be more direct. <laughs> Joe, how are you doing with your project? Whoa, well, thank you. Uh, I would enough, love to enough. talk about my projects. So the original project that we talked about in the very first episode was a little benchtop milli guy that was um, small. It had like a six inch by three inch cut area. And uh, I haven't touched it. Um, <laughs> it and and um, it really falls into like that that point of like, I solved all the problems I was hoping to solve with that thing. It's now converted to a modern controller and uh, it works. Um, but I, most of the things that I make are too big to fit on that mill. So the mill mm. itself was the project and I haven't really had anything to make on it except for the main reason I have that guy is um, we do a couple events every year uh, that are geared towards engineering and, and kids. And I bring that mill to those because it's really fun to um, have everyone walk around and go, oh, that's a weird looking 3D printer. And then go, no, this isn't a 3D printer at all. This is the opposite of a 3D printer. It's a CNC mill. And then you know, have a printer next to it making the same part and explain the differences. It's a, it's a really good demo. Um, so I will probably have that at um, our at, at the event that we're going to in February. So I have a couple other projects. Um, do you want to bounce around post? Yeah, let's bounce around. I wasn't sure how to do sure. this. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, what are you working on? So uh, I may have mentioned it about a month or so ago, but over uh, my my work uh, tends to shut down for about two weeks around Christmas time so they can do inventory and whatnot. And I had a bunch of free time where I was, I, I set some time aside to upgrade my home networking infrastructure. Um, I have a very nice fully open source networking stack at home where I had, well, I had um, PF sense as a router slash firewall. I had FreeNAS as a network attached storage server. Um, my access points were running DDWRT. And what else? I don't know. Anyways, uh, I got most of it upgraded over that break. Um, that included a, a new um, desktop PC that was running Ubuntu server um, to run all my little microservices. So like I have PyHole running, which is for uh whole network ad blocking and a DNS server. And I had home assistant for my home automation server. Um, I wanted to add a wiki for my own home use. So uh, when I do different home projects, whether it's like hobby or just maintaining stuff around the house, I actually have a wiki just for my own personal home life. I wanted that. I, uh, I wanted a VPN server so I can access my stuff at home. Also, I want to do Nextcloud so I can do you know, self-hosted Google Cloud file storage stuff. What's on your home life wiki? Nothing yet because it doesn't <laughs> exist. Okay. But the idea was... How do you, how do you use the washer and dryer? <laughs> like, like are, you, are you showing your wife how to make you the toast the proper way or no. to properly mix a tom collins <laughs> <laughs> please there's just like a qr code on your bottle of did whiskey. you not refer to the wiki <laughs> i'm trying to remember why i wanted one i wrote it down i said three cubes of sugar not two <laughs> so i think it was more for you know we all we always do things that have little caveats, all these little micro compromises when we do projects like, well, you know, best case scenario, everything should work. But because we're strapped for time, there'll be these few things you have to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no good way to document those. 
And I figured a home wiki would be the way to do it. Okay. Whether yeah, it's car enough. maintenance, you know, home infrastructure maintenance, just general thoughts, things I want to remember later. I'd rather have it easily documented in a wiki rather than like a Google Doc because Google Docs take a while to load up mm-hmm. and you can't really index yeah. them and quickly find the information you need. I, I actually learned a lot doing our Makerspace wiki last summer as far as how do you organize information in a quick lead, in a, in a way to quickly find the information you need, which mm-hmm. is a very interesting challenge. I didn't think it'd be that hard, but I spent a good two weeks figuring out how to organize our wiki and I've gotten a lot of great feedback on it and everybody loves it. Anyways, that's nice. why I would want a personal wiki. But okay. Back to the main topic. Uh, <laughs> so I got all my stuff. So I bought a new, a tiny little, it was really neat. It was off at of AliExpress, but it's a little four port. It looks like a switch, like a Netgear or whatever, like networking switch. But it has a quad core atom processor in it. It has two gigs of RAM and a eight gig solid state drive in it or like in whatever it's a really it's a tiny little appliance networking device and i put open sense on it which is a pf sense alternative it's people from the original pf sense project that forked it because there's a bit of a controversy last summer from the original pf sense project huh sure sounds um, like next cloud <laughs> it's, it's, i mean it's the exact same thing where it's a difference in opinions and belief systems mm-hmm um, if you know anything about programming, the PFSense web UI has root access to the computer, which is not great. It's not a great way to do things. Um, but the nope. OpenSense has a proper MVC uh, paradigm to it, which is a uh, mainframe view controller, where okay. you have a database, you have the backend stuff in the mainframe, a view, which is what you see, and a controller where the view will say to the controller, I want to update the back end. Then the controller does the update to the back end. So okay. you, it, it abstracts that. So it's, it's, it's a bit safer. It's a bit more organized. But oh my gosh, the UI is so much better than PFSense. It's way easier. <laughs> that's, that's not hard. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. So anyways, I have OpenSense on that little router. Um, I got that ser- the Docker server set up. Um, and I, and I had a FreeNAS server since like 2014 or 2015 that I never, I, I upgrade, it was on FreeNAS 9.3 stable and that got, that's, they stopped upgrading that like two and a half, three years ago. Um, so I haven't upgraded it since and I wanted to get it to up to the latest, which is 11.2. I tried that over break and it just didn't work and I ran out of time. So I've been without a NAS and all my all my movies and TV shows that were stored, I haven't had access to for like a month. Oh, nice. Uh, That's no. fun. So, yeah, so today I was spending time getting that properly upgraded, which I ended up just wiping it and reloading it because the ZFS pool just stays there. I mean, I was, I was easily able to import it. But it, it took me most of today because it took me a while to realize that my USB drive went bad because they recommend you boot it off of a USB drive. <laughs> So I've had this USB drive sitting in the computer for the past four years because they recommend you boot it off a USB drive. Right. Fair enough. And I tried to install it, and it took like hours to install. I'm like, well, maybe it's because I'm booting it off of a CD drive to install it because I couldn't get the other thing to work well. But after, but uh, once I got it installed, like it took forever even to load the web UI. I'm like, hey, this can't be right. So... uh I had a spare 16 gig solid state drive sitting around from an old router build that I did. Do that in there and installed within like 10 minutes. And I let it up and it's just like bam, bam, bam. It's like everything is super quick. So it was a bad USB drive that went bad after four years. Yeah. So nothing's worse than stupid. But dude, the the FreeNAS 11.2 new web UI, it's written all in Angular. And it is gorgeous. It is very well organized. Looks awesome. Nice. Yeah. Anyways, that's my first update. Is that I got my <laughs> my NAS 
mostly back up and running and up, updated, so it's now up to date and somewhat secure. Excellent. There you go. Um, my only update, because like currently I'm, I am really busy with work. We get it. You have um, a job, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So one of the things that I, I really want to do uh, before MakerFest um, is I would love to redo my uh, arcade game controller um, that's two players, and I would love to have that on a stand rather than in a arcade cabinet. And so that way I can just like plop it down anywhere, hook it up to a TV, and just have it playable. Um, well, that also so has the kegerator in it. Yeah. What about the kegger? That was the whole reason that project was cool. The bar has been set so high. It really has, man. It really has. Man, I know how you um, the me like the kegerator. I want to design a tap handle for that. Hopefully, we can get that done before Murph. If we can't then... get that done before Murph, we are losers. Good There's lord! There's like two I mean... months. We have Come so much on. stuff already that we're falling behind on for that. <laughs> Maybe you do. Like, <laughs> I would. <laughs> I have plenty of time. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. <laughs> as long as I don't add like six things to my docket before then, I'm doing great. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. But that's the only thing. Like, I, I would love to have that done. Um, I really want to actually have that done within the next couple months. Um, cause I'm actually going to be hosting apparently a video game tournament at my house. Um, and we're going to be, you were the one who said that you wanted to do this thing. You were the one who were like, I want to come if you're doing this. Who, who did? I, who said that? I, I just Eric. said that I wanted to come if you were buying Mortal Kombat. I didn't, I, yeah. I didn't say I wanted to make a <laughs> tournament out of it. Well, uh, tournament I mean, is if somebody's more throwing less the gauntlet like, down. <laughs> Are we playing but Gauntlet? I would. Me and I, I would. Dur, dur, I am dur, trying dur. to have. <laughs> I'm trying to have original Mortal Kombat, Mortal Kombat Two, and maybe original Street Fighter, um, on there. Like Super or Super Turbo would be awesome if I could have that working. Um, and so that way, when everybody comes over for this like video game day, um, around Mortal Kombat 11's or release, then. Uh, We'll be able to play a whole bunch of Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter and all the good ones. So that is when I'm shooting to have it done. So and we're planning on doing that in April. So we'll see. Hopefully that will actually be done soon and we can have that ready for that. Hmm. But uh That sounds super how about, fun. Man, I, I really am actually like every time that I think about it, I'm like, man, it's another like huge thing. But I really can't wait for this one because that's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> Like just having a whole bunch of people over and playing like a crap ton of Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat is like hella fun. <laughs> but all right, uh, Joe, how about your second update? Terrarium. All right, so I don't know if I've actually talked about this on the show. I have been working on an automated terrarium for one of my chameleons for like a year. It sounds ridiculous that it's taken this long, and it completely is because I uh, started from scratch and then got back to where I was in one day yesterday. Uh, <laughs> um, but fair enough. It is uh, based around a Raspberry Pi three B plus, and um, it uh, is running a software. Uh, it's an open source uh, project called Terrarium Pi. Um, by a user called the Yash on GitHub. And I'm I'm honestly glad that I put it off a little bit because in the time that I've put it off, uh, the project has matured so much. It's incredible. Isn't that the best? Yes. <laughs> when your procrastination pays off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but it's, it's super cool. So it runs on the Pi and... Using the Pi GPIOs, I can control um, relays for turning my lights on and off. For um, they, a lot of users are using relays to control pumps to pump out of a 
bucket and control misting system. But what I'm actually going to do is use a uh, fluid solenoid uh, with water straight out of the shower that's right next to where my chameleon is because nobody uses the shower. So it's a perfect mixing valve so I can spray warm water instead of uh, freezing cold water. It's got a really nice uh, web UI and dashboard. And one of my favorite things about it uh, is I've been wanting to build something like this for about three years now. And one of the like main features I wanted was I wanted to be able to tell it a specific region of the world and mimic the current weather in that region of the world. And so like Ooh. day night cycles and uh, rain cycles for the misters and everything. I didn't even have to ask for that feature. This project just already did that. <laughs> it, it was what it was one of those the... things where it was like, I don't even have a good reason to try to start my own project because this one does it so well. Everything I've wanted. Dang. And uh, since I've hung out and just waited, he has uh, started integrating um, the smart hub outlets and things like that. Uh, like all a whole bunch of IoT devices are supported now. I'm not using any of them because I don't want that crap at my house. Um, I can do the same Amen. job. <laughs> I can do the same job with some a couple relays and some timers. Um, but I'm really, really excited about it because um, everything seems far more stable now. And um, uh, you know, just in like eight hours of playing, I was able to get back to where I was. Uh, so I'm running three temperature sensors, one for the basking area, one for ambient air, and one for the bottom of the cage, which is the coolest area. Uh, with chameleons, you have very tall cages. His cage is four feet tall um, and two feet by two feet. So uh, there's a large temperature gradient from the top of the enclosure to the bottom of the enclosure. And then the mister is controlled by a humidity sensor. So if the humidity drops below a certain percentage, the misters turn on and run for a set period of time. It's got integration for door switches. So I can see if I left his door open on accident, which I've done a ton of times. Um, and then he goes on adventures and then I have to go find him. <laughs> um, it has integration for webcams. So I can put a webcam in his cage. And a couple of people have actually written plugins for OpenCV, so you can uh, use the webcam to monitor movement in the enclosure. So, like, I can get a text message when he moves around, and I could be like, "Oh, look, the chameleon's doing stuff," um, <laughs> <laughs> which is, I think is super fun. And then he recently added a an audio thing so that you can set up a playlist to play jungle sounds. Which is just hilarious. Like that's, that's totally awesome. for you, but All right. <laughs> it's super cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a a really really cool project. Uh, like I said, it's called Terrarium Pi. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's all open source, and it runs on all of the uh, current Raspberry Pis, including the Zero, which I was shocked to see. Because uh, last time mm. I was looking at it, he was uh, saying he wasn't even going to try to support the Zero. So kind of excited that he's doing that but yeah i'm i'm looking forward to finishing up building out the electronics i'm hoping to do that over the next two days and uh, get him moved over to this enclosure because it's turning out pretty awesome aaron how about yours what is what is your next project that you're working on well my uh the main one for this year will be the makerspace access control system and i made a little bit of headway this weekend on it um, my main goal was to get the pinouts figured out and then get a PCB ordered for it just so I can have a very stable um, developer unit so I can write the firmware. But as we talked about an episode or two ago about how do you handle a project when you're <laughs> when you've taken a bigger bigger <laughs> bite than you can chew. Right. I thought I was pretty conservative in the way that I approached it, but even that was a bit much. Uh, it turns out, so I had I had borrowed some. Well, here's the thing: I've got some bre <laughs> I've got some breadboards that I used to prototype all my things with, 
But the yep. freaking I'm using an I'm I'm using now an ESP32 development board. It's like the Node MCU okay. um, format, but with an ESP32 chip instead of the 8266. So it's a bit it's a dual core, a bit more powerful, has a lot more radios and technology in it for sure. bet, for cooler future stuff. But the thing is, the dev board is like slightly it's it, on the breadboard. It's like slightly too wide where I only have one row of pins available uh. on one side and not the other side. <gasps> so I can't use it. And that threw a whole wrench in my entire weekend. I had borrowed some female to female jumper pins in hopes that I could cut them in half and solder the bare wire ends onto my um my breakout boards and then just female jumper pin into the dev board. But even sure. that was too much. I tried that <laughs> earlier today and that was a, a hassle. So now Sheesh. I'm just gonna see if I can just buy a, a bigger breadboard. Cause all I want to do is just get the pinouts correct. And I also spent some time on some uh, uh, circuit board design software. So I've or- I've been wanting to learn KiCad for a while, or KiCad, depends. I don't know how you pronounce it. KiCad. KiCad. So I wanted to learn that for a while, but it seemed very complex and intimidating. So I found an alternative called Libre PCB, which looks really neat. Um, it's it's a very it's a very intuitive way to um, draw your electrical schematics, and it can export PCB Gerber files, but in its current state, it's not that mature, and you can only do very simple schematics. Mm. So I ended up reading through the official KiCad tutorials and started that today, but even that was a bit overwhelming. The high point of KiCad is it's supported out of the box by uh, Osh Park. So you can take KiCad yeah. files and drop them straight into Osh Park and have your stuff made. So no, oh. That was actually my plan, was to export it to Osh Park. Osh Park. I have a ton of Osh Park credits, so I know you do. I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna ask you for a coupon code. You can have them. <laughs> um, but uh, the other thing is, like, if you ever need resources for stuff like that, uh, hit Drew up. Uh, Drew's always looking to it, and this goes for all of you guys. Uh, Osh Park is always looking to support open source PCB projects. Uh, in various uh, ways that are useful. And one of the ways is they've got some uh, pretty good resources for learning KiCad and submitting your designs to Osh Park. So um, if you guys ever have that, uh, anything like that, uh, you should go look up Osh Park and talk to them. And uh, they sh- they're they they're pretty, pretty great guys. So Nice. Yeah, so my current plan for the access control system is to get a custom PCB ordered where I can just solder on my RFID scanner, my button, the ESP32 dev board. Um, What else do I have? An LED to, just a simple LED to represent the solid state relay. So I don't have to carry that around. I'm also a NeoPixel. Okay. Also with that, a level shifter because the ESP32 is 3.3 volts and the NeoPixels require 5 volt logic so we need a level shifter or a logic shifter Sure. but I just wanted a, a, a simple custom PCB that I could just solder those onto and it would just be a very nice robust development platform where I can then write the firmware for it and that was kind of my first step um, once I do the firmware my next step would be working on the back end which is the Linux database rest uh golang api boy that sounds hard <laughs> that part is actually easy for me this is the hard part now because <laughs> i've never done electrical design and schematic design so this is the hard part fair enough yeah but uh so the goal is get the this very basic thing done first um then do the back end stuff then we can just order more rfid scanner because these are all breakout boards, so order more RFID scanner breakout boards, order more level shifter breakout boards, all that stuff. Then we have a very rough, you know, you know, uh, min, uh, you know, minimum viable product things that we can then actually implement to then test out the back end. While we're testing out the back end, I want to come back around and 
uh, redo the PCB design where it incorporates all of the dev board components without the dev boards. So like the actual chips that are on the boards and the resistors and the schematics incorporate those into one single PCB that I can have ordered. Um, okay. From somebody, some, from some place that can actually assemble the whole thing for me. Because my, my end goal is I'm actually thinking about making this a bit of a, a turnkey product. So nice. we'll see how that goes. Oh, that's rad, dude. That's rad. I support that because every makerspace wants it and every makerspace starts the project and no makerspaces finish it. So I fully support <laughs> you finishing it. Be, be the differentiator in our world, Aaron. I believe it because... I have seen so many instances in this in, in our makerspace where that system could have solved a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah. And like we were just talking about one today where we're having members who are using our, our bandsaw. What, what, what was it? Are they using a metal blade and they're cutting wood with it or a wood no. blade and they're cutting metal with it? They're using a wood blade. That's the assumption. Uh, there was a brand new blade put on there like a week ago and uh, one our member that manages all the wood shop equipment came in tonight and it was just completely dull. Like every tooth was round. So uh, that's uh that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Round teeth are not what you want in a bandsaw. Yeah, so a system like this sort of system would have at least given us It would have told us who's worked on it. So yeah. we can be like, hey, hey, stop it. Or I'm going to beat you with the round toothed blade. <laughs> See how you like that. I mean, yeah, it would it, like that kind of stuff would be high in demand at a lot of makerspaces, I feel like. But that's pretty rad. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's a very ambitious project. So what, yeah. what kind of drives me nuts about the whole tech shop closure was that was the one thing they did really well was they had a whole access management system with an RFID set up and it was a database and it was well supported and it was well thought out. And when they shut down a but well before they shut down, I asked them if they were willing to license it to community maker spaces like us. And uh, they were like, well, it's not really part of our business plan. We'll have to talk about it, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, they needed to make it part of their business plan because nobody had any money in that corporation, which is why they shut down. And like, it, it frustrates me that when the corporation shut down, that project died and they, they could have open sourced it and they knew that there was an appetite for an open source version of it and they didn't. And it makes me mad, yeah. Dan. Woods. That makes well, me mad. Especially just, <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, cool, now that tech is just sitting it's, nowhere doing nothing. It's gone. You know, it's tied up yeah. it's tied up in lawyer land and uh mm. it's gone. So Yep. Yeah. It's a shame. It, it's really it's really frustrating. You can call some other Could names have done a lot out, of good. But <laughs> Dan's the easy one. Um <laughs> You working on anything else, Christian? <laughs> uh, yeah. I as as you were talking about your terrarium, um, it totally reminded me of one other project that I'm actually working on. Um, so I really want to get into uh, aquaponics. Uh, I think that it's a super cool science, yeah, and engineering kind of combo. Um, and so I'm kind of going the really expensive way of doing this because I'm stupid. Um, and I've funded a Indiegogo campaign for the Eco Garden. You are stupid. Uh, the world's <laughs> smartest interactive ecosystem. Um, yes, I know, I know. Um, basically, I kind of want to. I I funded this project, and this is kind of what got me into aquaponics. And I was like, this is really cool, and I want to learn about this. And so I went ahead and I bought a bought into a, a Indiegogo campaign that is doing exactly that. And I kind of want to learn from them and learn uh, with their stuff. And then eventually from that, I am planning on developing and open sourcing my own design based off of it. And so uh, hopefully that one is, I think, set to arrive in April. 
Um, and then when that one finally gets in, I'll be able to kind of observe it for a little bit and be able to figure out, hey, this is what they're doing really good. This is what they're doing really bad. And then also, like, what do I want to improve upon and do all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm really excited about it. Um, I really would love for the design that I do work on to eventually end up possibly in our makerspace. Um, as I've been kind of like reviewing this kind of stuff, it's really cool to see the not only the benefits it has for doing like uh, crops and learning about that stuff, but it also has health benefits. Whereas like just keeping plants in a enclosed space where you're like um, like a machine shop or something like that uh, can also just help filter the air in certain ways. It filters the metal particles out of the air, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, absorb it, all it, the chips. <laughs> totally, it like yeah. No, but it will filter <laughs> uh, chemicals out of the air. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so that filter, like filter smells. So, so that's one of the cool things that I'm like, oh, this could be actually kind of cool for us to be able to have a small one at the maker space and be able to kind of just have this kind of cool thing that we can all take responsibility over and everybody would be able to see. So, um. Stay tuned for that one. I really haven't even started that one. I started doing research on it and into like plants and fish that work well with it. But as into the engineering part, I have not done a whole lot. Um, so as soon as I get the new one, um, I will absolutely start this. And hopefully uh, by hopefully year's end, I might actually have something that resembles a aquarium and aquaponics. What is aquaponics? So aquaponics is um, essentially it's plants and fish working off each other. So um, fish uh, feed off of just either uh, plant waste or feeder um, and their waste goes into a filtration system that sends it up into the plants and the plants get nutrients from the fish waste and the fish waste helps them mature quicker and also um, the plants to better be better fertilized. Um, and then the plants, their waste and anything like that gets filtered in the fish and the fish, um, survive off that as well. So the whole filtration system is a, is a, uh, contained ecosystem that's supposed to work off of each other. Um, and that's, what's really cool about it is it's supposed to be self-sustaining, but, um, you obviously have to have some interaction with it, mainly the feeder, um, the feeder is supposed to supplement any food that they don't get from the plants. Um, but besides that, it runs on itself. It clean, it basically it cleans itself um, and does all the cool stuff. So uh, that's what's kind of cool about aquaponics is it does all these really kind of cool things just running in the background by itself. And it says it's, it's its own ecosystem running on its own. Um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been interested in aquaponics for a while. So I'm excited that you're you're diving into it, so I have somebody to talk to about it. Yeah, no, it's it's super cool. Um, I really am like excited to just have one in my kitchen, um, and I'm planning on for myself cooking or cooking, uh, growing herbs and spices with it, um, so I can use it for cooking. Nice. Um, just to be able to like, cause like one of the big ones they say is really good to use with it is like parsley and sage. Um, and those are really like good smelling plants as well to have just growing in your house. Yeah. yeah. They just keep so growing. I'm really excited. Yeah. About yeah. And if you do it right, you can also harvest fish. That's what I've heard. I have not, I've not probably, done. Probably need a I bigger tank than a kitchen tank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> If I were to get like the the plan with my open source one is to eventually be able to scale it and get something like a 15 gallon tank and have that at the space and we could grow multiple pods of different stuff and have that at the space. But as for mine that I'm going to be receiving, um, it looks like it's only going to be about a I think it's a 4.5 or a five gallon tank. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> I'll definitely but, help you yeah. with the firmware on that when you get around to it. I'd be happy yeah, to well, I'm back. excited. That'll be a lot of fun. But, uh, all right. Well, does anybody have any other projects that they are currently working on? I have a very tiny update. Sure, go ahead. I So, for I mentioned in the last podcast or two that I made this little recording studio at my house. Mm -hmm. And I finally figured out a solution for my lighting. Because okay. I, I have the whole thing 
wrapped with the acoustic recording blankets. Uh, but that only leaves me with a couple of grommet holes with which to actually attach any sort of lighting. Okay. So I actually went to Lowe's and I found this like one inch by one inch vinyl corner molding for like drywalling. So I actually have that set up so that I have a nice little one inch shelf right around the upper perimeter. And the idea is once I get my other two blankets in, which by the way, have not been shipped yet from Florida. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I just heard that today that they haven't been even shipped yet. Anyways, Sheesh. I'm waiting on those to finish it, but I actually have the first two up and it's going to be really great because it's right up. It's a good two inches below the t very top of my little studio. Um, and the idea is that I have some, I have some, uh, a good 10 to 12 foot strip of white LEDs with a little mm -hmm. inline dimmer. And I'm going to hot glue them to the shelf portion of the molding. And it's going to wrap all the way around my recording studio. So then the idea is that I can then drop the wire down and have a uh, very nice white LED up lighting in a way that nice. I can't actually see the LEDs, which would give me a bad glare. Mm. But then I get a nice soft reflected glow. Nice. Down. So I'm really excited for there that. You go. Nice. I'm just and I just did that today too. So I'm really excited I figured something out that was easy. There you go. So I'll let you know when that's finally done. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, if nobody else has got anything else, um, we are about at our normal wrap up time. So uh, I think we're going to go ahead and close it out. I uh, want to thank you for listening. If you have stuck all the way through this and had a fun time with us, if you want to get in contact with us, you can check out our subreddit at r slash makers on tap. Uh, check us out on social media at makers on tap or MOT. Um, and then anything else? I don't think so. Um, no. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you for listening. And we hope to see you next week or hear from you next week. Uh, have a good one. And this is the end of the podcast. <laughs>